morning, everyone. Good morning. So good to be together again in this place. So good to see those of you on the east side here this morning. And thank you for making the trip to join us and, and uh, enhance the fellowship that we have today. I think we have a wonderful service ahead. Uh, it's always wonderful when we have communion. And we hope that we will all be blessed by this service. I would like to begin our service with prayer. Father in heaven, we come together on this day that you have given us to celebrate creation and redemption and to give us rest in our bodies as you have given us by grace rest to our souls. I pray that this day may be a blessing to each person here and those who are viewing from afar. And I pray that you will bind us together in one body, the body of Jesus Christ, as we experience the presence of the Spirit in this place and wherever your children are today. In Jesus' name, amen. What a special day it is that we can celebrate the Lord's Supper together. I'd like to look back at the, the first Passover in Egypt and invite you to turn to Exodus 12, where we have some interesting 
words and phrases used to describe what the first Passover was about. In Exodus 12, in verse 3, at the very end of verse 3, it says, God instructs Moses and Israel that they are to have a lamb for each household, a lamb. Of course, that lamb ultimately was to symbolize the lamb of God, which takes away the sin of the world. In, in verse 5, the first part of the verse says, Your lamb shall be without blemish in a male. Jesus Christ was without blemish. He was born to a sinful family, but what he was without sin or blemish. And then in verse 6, the last part says that that lamb was to be killed at twilight. And verse 7, and they shall take some of the blood and put it on the two doorposts and on the lintel of the houses where they eat it. So now we have, come with me as we make this analogy here. And this, this is a shadow of a greater Passover that was to take place. And, uh, and so we have the blood of the lamb covering the doorposts of our homes and our hearts to protect us against the death angel that will come through this earth one day and destroy, once again, destroy that which is evil and evildoers. And it says in verse 12, for I will pass through the land of Egypt on that night and will strike all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast. And against all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgment. I am the Lord. Now the blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you. And the plague shall not be on you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. In Luke chapter 22 and verse 15, Jesus said, and by the way, every gospel, all four gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, all either record the story of the first communion service or the Passover revisited in light of the lamb who would take away the sin of the world. All four Gospels either tell that story or make reference to it. And in Luke, Luke is always unique in his telling of the story of Christ. He says in verse 14, When the hour had come, Jesus sat down and the twelve apostles with him, and Jesus said to them, With fervent desire, fervent desire, I have desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. With fervent desire, I have looked forward to this moment when we would be together to celebrate the Passover with you before I suffer as the Lamb of God. So at the beginning of our service today, I want to, I want to celebrate the Lord's Supper first. We are continuing a series of studies that we began last Sabbath entitled Life at Its Best. Our text of scripture comes from John chapter 10. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. The thief does not come except to steal and to kill and to destroy. I have come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. I have come that you may have life and have it at its best, life at its best. That, those are the words of Jesus Christ to us. And we learned last Sabbath in our message, we talked about the idea that this place where Jesus is, is actually a place where we can go. It's a place. 
just to support that in your minds before we go on in our study, I just want to remind you that when Jesus said that the kingdom of God had come, he said, if I cast out demons by the Spirit of God, by the hand of God, the kingdom of heaven has come to you. The kingdom of God was established when he came. And Calvary, the cross of Calvary, was its flag. It was a place. A place. The kingdom of God is a place. The kingdom of heaven is a place that exists here on earth among us and is here with us. And in fact, is in us. Jesus said, the kingdom of God is in you. So when I talk about this place where life is at its best, I'm not talking about the places out there where life is crazy. I'm talking about that retreat, that sanctuary of the heart where God comes to us and gives us peace and safety and freedom. He is the light that comes to our hearts and shines in the darkness. He is the life that comes to us and dwells within us through his spirit. It is a place where he is. He lives within us. He says, I will make my home with you. In your hearts, he comes to us. And so this is a place. Life is at its best is a place that we can retreat to when all around us is crazy, is perhaps unbearable sometimes. This place is a place for the condemned, for the lost. This place where he is the door. He says, I am the door. And he who enters by me will find that he can go in and out and find pasture, find, find peace in the pastures of his presence. And food is a place for the hungry. It's a place for the thirsty. He said, I am the bread of life. I am the water of life. I am the light of life. It's a place where Jesus says, it's a place for the fearful. And how many people are fearful today? I mean, it's no wonder the chaos that is in our world is a fearful place to live. Yet this place where Christ is, is a place for the fearful. And it is where life is at its best in that sanctuary of the soul. It is a place for the deceived. Satan has, as I mentioned earlier, Satan has built a chapel right beside the church of Jesus Christ so that he can, he can harass followers of Christ. It is a place of freedom. Jesus said to us, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And the truth will set you free. It is a place where when we are exposed to truth in the darkness, that is around us and perhaps even within us. The light shines upon that darkness and it frees us. The, the truth will set us free. In Matthew chapter 4, verse 16, the people who sat in darkness have seen a great light. And upon those who sat in the region and the shadow of death, light has dawned. I would like to read something that I found, uh, a, an account of Martin Luther. And I read it because it is so powerful, there's no way I could possibly tell it the way this is written. In 1510, it says that he went to Rome. While he was there, he went to a place called Scala Sancta, which means holy stairs in Latin. These steps went up, and they are said to have been the very steps that had been been moved uh, to that place that where Jesus went up the steps to the Praetorium when he was on trial before, before uh, Pilate. So these were holy steps, right? They consisted of 28 white marble steps encased in wood. And it says that the Catholic Church taught that by ascending these steps on your knees, in the appropriate fashion, you could buy an indulgence for someone in purgatory. If you ascended each step reciting, Our Father, 
you could release a soul from purgatory. And Luther wanted his grandfather released from purgatory. So he went up these steps. And while he was climbing the stairs on his knees, it says that he thought he heard a voice of thunder which cried out in the bottom of his heart, from the depths of his heart, the just shall live by faith. The just shall live by faith. That is a statement of scripture. And he was said to have raised up in amazement from the steps and he began to feel personal horror and shame. And he cried out verbally, the just shall live by faith. So as Luther later wrote of this experience, it says, he says, I, although I was a holy and irreproachable monk, my conscience was full of trouble and anguish. I could not bear the words, justice of God. I loved not the just and holy God who punishes sinners. For that's how he had been taught. I was filled with secret rage against him and hated him because not satisfied with terrifying his miserable creatures already lost in sin, with his law and the miseries of life, he still further increased our torment by the gospel. Gospel? But when by the Spirit of God I comprehended these words, when I learned how the sinner's justification proceeds from the pure mercy of the Lord by means of faith alone, that I felt myself revived like a new man and entered at open doors into the very paradise of God. Jesus says, I am the door. He who enters by me will be saved. And from that time on, Luther spent his time studying the scriptures and finding out what the Bible actually had to say about salvation. And then later on, he wrote, and the reason this is so critical is because as we will see, and I will share this probably next week, but I, I have some documents that I want to share with you that shows why the gospel of Rome is different than the gospel of, uh, that we hold dear today, the gospel of scripture. So later, after Luther discovered the error of the church that he was a part of and the deception and the evil that was in it. He said, it's almost incredible what infamous actions are committed at Rome. One would require to see it and hear it in order to believe it. And as I mentioned last week, Sammy and I are reading a book called 50 Years in the Church of Rome. And I have that on my computer in a PDF. If anybody would like to have a copy of that, it is an account of Father Charles Chinequi who spent 50 years in the Church of Rome, and it gives his story from childhood as to how the errors and the, the crimes of the Church of Rome impacted his life and the lives of so many. This is all leading to, this is all leading to, my comments are all leading to that which has to do with the gospel of Jesus Christ. So about seven years later, Martin Luther stood up and publicly stood against the Church of Rome by nailing the 95 Theses against the wall. And that was the beginning of a fiery and powerful reformation in our world, in, that, in Europe at the time. And that's where we got Protestantism. And people lost their lives. People gave their lives for the sake of what? The gospel of Jesus Christ, the gospel we take it so for granted, it seems. We take it so for granted. So, Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. In contrast, Satan is the author of deceit and the prince of darkness who has perverted the gospel of Jesus Christ, which is the keystone of our faith. Guy, okay. as I talk to you this morning, I almost feel like I'm making a, a, a lot to do about something that is, eh, maybe it's really not that significant, you know? I mean, my goodness, 
How is it that the Catholics might believe or, the, or some other church? How about that the, the Mormons or the, the Adventists or, or, the, or the Jehovah's Witness or many other faiths, even Protestant churches, could possibly be so erroneous in their understanding of something as simple and common in the Word of God as the Gospel of Jesus Christ? I want you to know that, that the Reformation in the lives of millions was lost over that one thing as the foundation, the foundation of the Reformation. That was the beginning of the Reformation, is Luther's realization that it wasn't the church that saved, it wasn't even what God does in the believer that saves us, but it is solely what Jesus Christ did for us, his doing and his dying on our behalf as us 2,000 years ago and our faith in him. That's where the five solas came from. Only the Bible, out of the Reformation, the Word of God, the Word of God is the sole source of inspiration for us to base our faith on and to our understanding of who Jesus was and what he did. The, the scriptures are the only, only source of inspiration. And Jesus is the only savior. The church can't save us. I don't care which church you belong to. It won't save you. There's nothing about the church that can save us. You can belong to any church you wish and it will not save you. The Roman Catholic Church will not save you. There are so many churches that state that they are the only church. They're the only church. We did a study on that a few weeks ago called the True Church. There's only one church, and that's the Church of Jesus Christ. It is the mystical Church of Christ that bases its faith in Jesus Christ on the Word of God and salvation by grace through faith alone. By grace alone, through faith alone, and only for His glory. The Reformation... The Reformation was the breakthrough. It was, it was a resurrection of truth. It was a resurrection of the scriptures. It was a resurrection, if you please, of, of Christ as our salvation. It came out of the dust of the deception and error of the Church of Rome and exists even today in, in our in our world, it, it still exists. Not just the Church of Rome, but deception and error in regard to the gospel. Turn with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 4. 2 Corinthians is an amazing book to me. 2 Corinthians has so many. 2 Corinthians contains my very favorite verse in the whole Bible. 2 Corinthians 4 and verse 6 says, It is the God who commanded light to shine out of darkness, who has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. God called light out of darkness, Genesis 1. And he has called light out of darkness into the hearts of men, as he has, has given to us the light of the world within and expressed through his word. It is the only light that you can count on as being true and faithful to who God is and what he has done. It is the God who commanded light to shine out of darkness who has shone in our hearts. You can almost see this great spotlight that comes from heaven into our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Peter talks about something similar to this in 2 Peter chapter 1. And beginning with verse 16, Peter says, you, you can't imagine how, how important this experience was that the disciples had walking with Christ the Son of God, the light of the world. You can't, you can't imagine. I, I mean, I'd like to imagine what it would have been like, but you can't, we can't imagine how wonderful 
it must have been for these men to have walked along with Jesus those three and a half years of his ministry and to understand once the body and the blood of Jesus was offered for us how wonderful it was I want to read not only from Peter but also from John this says in 2 Peter 1 verse 16 for we did not follow cunningly devised fables of deception which are everywhere today and it's so important that we get this right we did not follow cunningly devised fables when we made known to you the power and the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ but were eyewitnesses of his majesty they saw the light that had come to bring light to the dark world for he received from God the Father honor and glory when such a voice came to him from the excellent glory they heard this voice they heard the voice of God say this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased we heard this voice which comes from heaven when we were with him on the holy mountain and so we have the prophetic word confirmed that is that which is in the Old Testament confirmed by the story that they experienced with Christ which you do well to heed as a light that shines in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star arises in your hearts what a beautiful passage huh a beautiful passage I love John's statement too and in first John chapter 1 let's read just those verses in the first part of first John chapter 1 it's almost like what Paul says in 2 Corinthians 4 about the light of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ John says that which was from the beginning remember John wrote the gospel of John too and how does he start that that gospel out that book out in the beginning was the word the God who created light out of darkness in the beginning was the word John says at the beginning of his gospel and here he says that which was from the beginning which we have heard which we have seen with our eyes which we have looked upon and our hands have handled they touched him as they lived with him concerning the word of life the life was manifested and we have seen and bear witness and declare to you that eternal life which was with the father and was manifested to us that which we have seen and heard we declare to you John says that you also may have fellowship with us and truly our fellowship is with the father and with his son Jesus Christ and these things we write to you that your joy may be full the gospel we call the first four books of the New Testament the Gospels that is the story of Christ Paul was an apostle of the gospel Paul was chosen by Jesus also to be an apostle of the gospel in Romans 1 he says that he's in Romans 1 he calls himself the Apostle of the gospel Paul wrote half the New Testament much of which was spent in his writings defining for us and explaining to us what the gospel is and the effects that it has upon the life of a Christian Again, I want to remind you that we're studying this in the context of something that we will talk more about a little bit today and also in the coming two or three weeks as we contrast the gospel of scripture with, with that which is taught in Christendom that is meant to deceive us it is inspired by the devil himself just little innuendos that seems sometimes and I'll show you some of these too just little innuendos sometimes it's just something very little that makes such a huge difference 
And the gospel of Christ is very well defined in the scriptures and is so misrepresented by many claiming to be representatives of Jesus Christ. So here's my thesis. The gospel of scripture as declared and explained to us by Paul, the apostle of the gospel. He took the story of Christ that was written, that was written by Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. He took this story, the story of the life, the, the incarnation, the life. Christ encounters with evil and his power over evil. The one who delivered from darkness, the one who delivered from death, the one who delivered from deception and then gave his life as a sacrifice for us. Paul takes that story and helps us understand how that affects us as followers of Christ, as the people of faith in Jesus. So the gospel of scripture as explained and taught in the writings of Paul is that cornerstone of doctrine upon which the church stands or falls. That gospel is what the devil has sought to stamp out and to corrupt so that the light is snuffed out and the world is deceived and held in darkness bondage and fear and lostness. The gospel is that from which all other doctrinal truth proceeds and is defined for the Christian. The devil has corrupted the gospel and used the church to bring about darkness and bondage to the very people that Jesus came to set free. John 8 is an example of this in the time of Jesus. John chapter 8, beginning with verse 31. Jesus said to those Jews who believed in him, if you abide, if you continue, if you continue to live in the light of my word, you are my disciples indeed. And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Then they answered him, we are Abraham's descendants and have never been in bondage to anyone. How can you say you will be made free? They belonged to a church that was the chosen of God. They belonged to a people who had been chosen by God out of all of the heathen nations to represent him. Why, they were children of Abraham. What is your heritage? And then in verse 37, Jesus said, I know that you are Abraham's descendants, but you seek to kill me because my word has no place in you. And then verse 41, you do the deeds of your father. And they said to him, we were not born of fornication. We have one father, God. I mean, this is a religious group that is talking. These are people who are leaders in the church. And they're defending their faith and seeking to kill the very one who had come to save them. And verse 44, Jesus says, You are of your father the devil, and the desires of your father you want to do. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth, because there is no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own resources, for he is a liar and the father of lies. So it was that when Martin Luther came up against a system of religion that had corrupted the gospel of Jesus Christ and that affected everything then in their doctrinal stance for the people who were seeking God in, in that forum, in that arena, the fires of persecution were lit. People were burned at the stake. Martin, Luther, Martin Luther's life was sought. John Wycliffe, Huss and Jerome were burned at the stake. 
Listen. As somewhere it is estimated between 50 and 100 million Christians lost their lives because of their stand against Rome and its doctrines and its teachings. Next week I want to give you some examples not just of the Church of Rome, but other churches that exist in our world today, where the gospel has been corrupted. And I want to tell you again that this is something that we will study in the context of what Scripture says the gospel is. I want to, make, I want to put it as simply as I know how to put it. And we will contrast it with the teachings of other churches next week, including some of the churches that some of us have belonged to in the past. This is the gospel. I'm going to just say it as simply as I know how. Salvation for us is a result of the life, the life, the perfect life, the perfect righteous character, the, the perfect sinless life. Not just in deed, but in nature. Jesus was sinless. The gospel is that which tells us that we are saved by Jesus Christ, the sinless one, alone. His life, his death, his doing, his dying. All as if it were us. On Calvary, we were the ones. We exchanged places. My favorite verse, I said in 2 Corinthians, for you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor. A criminal. Actually, the sin of the world. He became. God, Paul says, God made him to be sin for us. who knew no sin. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that through his poverty you might be made rich. Actually, we receive the very inheritance that is rightfully his. That great exchange. Jesus died on the cross as me and as you. He did. His grace toward us is unmerited favor. We have nothing to do with it now or ever. That which is ours in him is ours solely because of his grace toward us which he can justify because he took the penalty for our sin. But he extends to us grace that covers all our sin. And that grace can be received by faith alone in him. And that has a period at the end of it. The gospel has a period at the end of it. Yes, does the gospel have an effect on our lives? Yes, but nothing that is, nothing that grows from out of our lives, nothing that is, is f the fruit of the gospel in received in our lives is the gospel. It is the fruit of the gospel. Righteousness in our lives is not the gospel. The gospel is a story of one who was sinless, who took my place and your place, lived my life, died my death and gives me credit for everything he did in exchange for my faith alone in him. Our works, no matter how wonderful they are that follow and no matter how important they are in the life of a Christian, are not the gospel. But so many want to make it the gospel. So many want to say, oh yeah, now that, now that Christ has forgiven us, now all of these things we must do in order to inherit eternal life. That is false. That is false. And that's where the Church of Rome went wrong. That's where the, yeah, the Adventist Church has gone wrong. That's where a lot of churches, even, even Protestant churches today, the gospel is simply for them. Oh, Jesus died for our sins. Isn't it wonderful that he's our Savior and we just receive his grace and have faith in him? Listen. That's a simplification of something that is so important that it almost is a mockery of it alone, if that's all we have to say about the gospel. Our safety in Christ is because of what he did alone today and forever. Today and forever. And the fruit 
of that, of that union with Christ is beautiful and a continually growing experience, but it is not the gospel. That is the fruit of the gospel. The gospel says Jesus alone, grace alone, faith alone, according to the scriptures alone. And for those who are listening today, I want to say to you that your church teaches that the gospel is becoming a portrait of Christ. Becoming a portrait of Christ is the gospel? No. That's as false as what the Catholic Church teaches. The gospel is not becoming a portrait of Christ. Are there results? Yes. From receiving the gospel of Jesus, receiving his grace by faith? Yes. The gospel is not becoming a portrait of Christ. The gospel is God's grace in Christ, given to us by faith alone, period. Period. You see what relief that gives to you? You see what relief that gave to Martin Luther? When he was working so hard to achieve the favor of God. Yeah. It changed his whole course of life. It changed my whole course of life when I discovered that. It'll change your course of life. It'll change your life with Christ. Once you understand what Paul has taught us about the gospel stories written by Matthew, Mark, Luke and John. Father in heaven, this morning as we have looked at these verses of scripture and how our world is going, even the Christian church, Lord, I pray that you will shine the light of heaven into our hearts and dissipate the darkness and make vivid the light not only saves us but energizes us to be followers of Jesus Christ and witnesses for his name. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.